he was quiet as he grew up, you know, he, he kind of, he's like a sponge, he just kind of took everything in. And when he felt the need to stand up, he never thought twice. I saw a young, funny guy going into war in Bed Kane, a very strict man, you know, so grown up so fast. I do believe this was something that was going to happen with Paul. From the day he was born, something was destined for Paul. My brother did a special thing and he died serving his country and doing what he believed. And today we bestow upon Sergeant Smith the first Medal of Honor in the War on Terror. With the Medal of Honor, Paul's going to go into history. His name will never die. Years of negotiations and political intrigue had brought America to the brink of war. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict. American soldiers were in Kuwait, poised for Operation Iraqi Freedom. One of the soldiers was Sergeant First Class Paul Smith of Bravo Company, 11th Engineering Battalion. He wanted his soldiers to be the best of the best when the time came. Some people didn't really get along with Sergeant Smith because of the, the way he ran his platoon and the way he carried himself. When we worked for Schmitty back at Stewart, it was, ah, oh, grumble, grumble. He was this mean platoon sergeant. Yeah, we'd work late every night. Paul did not start out as someone that could be so demanding. He could also be charming, fun-loving, and even a homebody. Let's take a look at the boy who became a man, destined for what some have called a great American hero. Paul Smith grew up in Tampa, Florida. Like most boys, he was focused on fun. Paul used to love to play with those little green army men. Typical little boys game, you know, him and his little sister would get out in the backyard and they'd have little wars with these army men. People would say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he'd say, I'm going to be a soldier. As a young boy, Paul knew exactly how to get out of a tight situation. I would get so angry with him. We'd be talking to him in a stern voice and he'd listen very straight face and then all of a sudden he knew I was winding down so he'd kind of give me this little crooked smile that just said okay mom you know and you just couldn't be mad at this kid he was just he brought so much laughter into our lives this happy-go-lucky child also had a serious side he saw things that children at 10 years old didn't see. I used to say he had an old soul because he didn't talk a lot, but he was like a sponge. He just absorbed everything in life. Through his teen years, Paul Smith attended Tampa Bay Tech Vocational High School. He was a typical student, not extremely smart in school, but he just seemed like he knew things that other people didn't know. After graduation, Paul was eager to join the Army. I said, if this is what you really want, he says, yeah, Mom, you know, I've always said I was going to join the military. And I said, okay. He says, I leave tomorrow. I'm like, you're leaving tomorrow? <laughs> you know, there's no time to try to talk you out of it even. <laughs> Paul trained in Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. Later, Paul was assigned to Germany, where he met Birgit Bakker. Well, I met Paul in the summer of 1990. He was a party animal, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> and we met in Germany. It was his first tour. Instantly, Paul was attracted to Birgit. After an evening of drinking, when the bar closed, a group, including Paul and Birgit, went to a park to talk. It was like about 3 o'clock in the morning as me and my girlfriend decided it's time for us to go. We are tired. So they walked us to the hotel room. Me and my girlfriend stayed that night. 
What happened next was right out of the movie Top Gun. Excuse me, miss. Hey, hey. Birgit entered her room and heard a strange noise. So I opened the window and I looked down and there was Paul and his friends. Paul on one knee, his arms up in the sky and singing You Lost That Loving Feeling. You lost that loving feeling. Oh, that loving feeling. You lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. The couple dated until November 1990 when Paul was deployed to Saudi Arabia and the first Gulf War. Paul Smith got a taste of war firsthand in the desert in Kuwait. The fighting was fierce, and he lost some fellow comrades. War, as they say, has a way of changing people. It was like you went as a boy into the war and came out as a man. Upon returning to Germany, he withdrew and avoided developing any kind of a relationship. I don't think so. We never fell out of love, but there was a split you know, in our relationship, and Paul just came to his sentence, I guess, <laughs> and realized what he lost. They were married January 24, 1992, in Denmark, where it was easier to get a marriage license. Paul was a devoted family man. He didn't go out. He rarely drank a beer. He didn't smoke. He, he didn't party. Paul and Birgit raised two children. Jessica and David loved spending Sundays together as a family when they could wrestle their dad. He was really devoted to his family because of the little time we had together. Paul spent long hours training, which often required him to be away for several days or weeks. He also was deployed overseas to Bosnia and Kosovo. We never discussed when Paul was deployed to Bosnia or Kosovo that he could not come home. That was not a possibility. On January 23, 2003, Paul was deployed once again. This time, he was sent to the deserts of Kuwait. His engineering battalion was on a mission to prepare to participate in what is now referred to as Operation Iraqi Freedom. My husband came back from the first war. Why shouldn't he come back from the second war? Especially all those years in between, he became a better soldier and, you know, drained hard. So I would never, never in a million years would I have thought that Paul wouldn't come back. Just a couple of days before Paul and his unit were sent into Iraq, he sends Birgit a letter. It said, you know, how much he misses us, and if I don't get any more mail after that, that means the war started and they moved on, that they can't. And that he misses the children. And not to worry. And he signed it off with, you're still the one. It's just our song. All right, to all of our family and friends back there and, uh, at home, like you see from the big mess you already saw already, we're staying busy and uh, we love you and miss you. You guys take care on the home front. The war came upon Paul and his platoon with lightning speed. Paul was unable to send his latest letter to his parents. Through all of his deployments, Paul never wrote a letter saying goodbye. I really believe that when Paul wrote this letter, maybe he didn't think about it consciously, but subconsciously, I think maybe Paul knew he wasn't coming home. On March 20th, Bravo Company crossed the border into Iraq and traveled more than 300 kilometers in the first 48 hours. Paul and his men worked long hours, always under threat of encountering the enemy. They were part of the first responders racing through Iraq. On the morning of April 4th, the 3rd Infantry Division was engaged in a battle to seize the Saddam Hussein International Airport. Sergeant First Class Smith and his platoon were assigned to find a holding area to keep a handful of prisoners that had been captured. One of the truck drivers alerted that 
special for the Iraqi special forces were coming out of build out of a building. Sergeant Smith took immediate action. He ordered some of his men to throw grenades over the wall where the Republican Guard waited. A battle ensued for the next 45 minutes. RPGs and small arms fire whirled through the air. And there was about, from estimated, about 120 to 150 Iraqi Special Republican Guards. A Bradley tank came to help the engineers in their battle. After it ran low on ammunition, it pulled back to a safe location to reload. The engineer's M113 armored personnel carrier with a 50 caliber machine gun was their primary defense. And it just escalated to the point that we realized that we were getting swarmed by the enemy. I think a total of 26, 27 RPGs were fired at us, and one RPG actually hit a track. Sergeant Burwald and a few other soldiers got small, minor shrapnel wounds. As we were getting them out, Sanchez so Smith climbed on the 50 cal and started providing suppressor fires to allow the personnel to uh, get evacuated. He was up there firing at the Iraqis and seamen just kept handing ammo cans to him over and over and over. Finally, seamen handed him up one last ammo can and he didn't reach for it. And seamen looked up and he wasn't in the hatch. And he looked around to see where Sergeant Smith was and he had been hit by one uh, round to the head. His efforts helped save the lives of many American soldiers just a few hundred meters back who were in vulnerable positions. He wanted to lead from the front. He got up on that 50 cal. That wasn't his place. 50 cal wasn't Smitty's place. He made a life decision. He was going to protect everybody involved. It hit really, really hard to that platoon. Knocked the wind out of him. Superman's down. Sergeant Smith died a few minutes later at the medical facility he helped protect. The Americans repelled the Iraqis and went on to take control of the Baghdad International Airport. They were alive. That's the big thing. And they knew why. It wasn't just Smitty. Because they were alive. It's because what Smitty taught them. They did what he told them to do. Back in the States, 11 p.m. Eastern Time, two soldiers knocked on the door of the Smith residence. Birgit and daughter Jessica answered the door. So we opened the door and I let him in. And uh, E7 told me that he had bad news. And I said, what? And he said, Paul is dead. <laughs> And I told him, I said, are you sure? They're, our last name is so common. Maybe it was a mistake, you know. And he said, ma'am, I wouldn't be here if it's not 100%. And I said, you know, my husband loved the military 100%. And I was always 100% behind him. But right now, I hate the military. So get out of my house. The next day, the men of Bravo Company remembered Paul. A brief memorial service was held at 8 in the morning. A rifle was stuck in a pile of dirt. A helmet rested on the stock. The role of platoon sergeants was called by First Sergeant Campbell. Sergeant Bergman. Here, First Sergeant. Sergeant Rausch. Here, First Sergeant. Sergeant Brown. Here, First Sergeant. Sergeant Smith. Sergeant First Class, Paul Smith. He went down here to do a job. He did his job. You know, his courage in making sure everybody around here got home safe. What he did here was outstanding. You know, we can never, you can't place a value on it. That was Paul, if you would have acted any different way, I would have thought something was wrong with him. For his actions on April 4th, and for his actions in other battles and other conflicts, Paul Smith has received no less than 20 medals, honors, and citations. And after his death, the Army looked into awarding him the highest medal of all. Other recognitions continued to pour in.
A firing range training center was named after him in Iraq. In Holiday, Florida, near his parents' home, a plaque recognizing his bravery was placed in the United States Post Office. And a high-tech training center for the military in Orlando, Florida, now bears his name. When they told us that they're going to nominate Paul for the Medal of Honor, it was, wow, you know, a, such a big honor. I just kind of sat back and went, wow, you know, everybody's going to know he's a hero. And then I kind of have to laugh to myself because all of my kids were heroes from the time they were little, you know. So I never saw Paul in any other light than a hero. Somebody put him in that place. Somebody told him what he had to do. And it wasn't the servicemen, or it was Paul and the man upstairs, as far as I can see. A hero? A national hero? Well, you know what? We have to have heroes. And if my brother's going to be one of our heroes, then I'm very honored. You cannot even put it in words how happy that makes me that with the Medal of Honor, Paul's going to go into history. His name will never die. This medal, for me, represents a lifetime of achievement, a lifetime of sacrifice, a lifetime of giving and loving. In 1861, the Medal of Honor was authorized by Congress as the nation's highest medal for valor in combat. Since then, more than 3,400 medals have been awarded. The Medal of Honor is bestowed on the bravest of the brave. The medal was first awarded during the Civil War on March 23, 1863, to Private Jacob Parrott and five others. Later that same year, our nation witnessed one of its greatest battles at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. On November 19, 1863, President Lincoln gave his now famous Gettysburg Address. He stated, in part, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Other wars brought many heroes. During the Spanish-American War, Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt led a charge up San Juan Hill in Cuba. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was an ace fighter pilot during World War I. During World War II, Second Lieutenant Audie Murphy led a concerted attack, directing artillery fire and personally fighting off the enemy. These Medal of Honor recipients have been joined by many others who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Since World War II, more than a half of those have been awarded this medal, gave their lives in the action that earned it. Sergeant Paul Smith belongs to this select group. On this day two years ago, Sergeant Smith gave his all for his men. And today we bestow upon Sergeant Smith the first Medal of Honor in the War on Terror. Sergeant First Class Smith's extraordinary heroism and uncommon valor are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, the 3rd Infantry Division Rock of the Marne, and the United States Army. The next day, Sergeant Smith was inducted into the Hall of Heroes at the Pentagon. All Americans stand taller today with pride and gratitude as they recognize Sergeant First Class Paul Smith for his heroic actions in Iraq. He truly lived and epitomized our warrior ethos. And now Paul joins America's truly most admired fraternity, those awarded the Medal of Honor. 
It's a fraternity so revered that President Harry S. Truman once confided to a soldier he decorated, he said, I'd rather have this medal than be president. Sixty years ago, American soldiers liberated the German people from tyranny in World War II. Today, another generation of American soldiers has given the Iraqi, the Afghanis, people a path of freedom. This is an ideal that Paul truly believed in. Later, Paul was memorialized at Arlington Cemetery in Virginia. On that day, 100 American soldiers witnessed and learned leadership of extraordinary proportions. Leadership that changed and influenced their lives forever. Those 100 men, in turn, will lead hundreds of soldiers who will benefit from that leadership gained with serving with Sark First Class Smith. On 2005, the SFC Paul Ray Smith Simulation and Training Technology Center held a commemoration in his honor. We're here to celebrate Sergeant Smith and dedicate a lasting tribute to his memory. The United States Army Research Institute established this center at the University of Central Florida in a cooperative alliance that is focused on conducting research for the men and women of our armed forces. And when I look up and I see Paul's picture, and the plaques that symbolize the Army and the units that he loved, I can see that would bring a smile to his face. But most of all, when I read the words above his picture, I am reminded of Paul's commitment to duty and to the soldiers he led into combat. That simple but profound definition, heroes are the people who do what need to be done, regardless of the consequences. The center is what Paul was all about, training. He trained his soldiers long hours. He required them to do things over and over again. He always stressed teamwork. He always tried to hit, get that engraved in our heads. If you are, if you are a team, you got to work as a team. Today, Paul's fellow soldiers and family reflect on his life and the gifts he gave for freedom. He knew that when the air became thick with lead and steel, his soldiers' lives could only be preserved and the unit's mission could only be achieved by professional warriors. No matter how much their hearts were clutched by fear, Paul knew that bravery was not the absence of fear, but the control of it. This country could uh, use a good hero to look up to. And I don't mean baseball players. Sorry, I don't mean basketball players, and I don't mean football players. The man to put his life on the line? No, that's a hero. When he first died, you know, the family kind of laughed and said, yeah, he's sitting up there on a cloud saying, oh, come on, you guys, you're making a big deal out of nothing. You know, this is just, just my job. I just did my job. And uh, we, we all kind of laughed because that's what Paul's attitude would have been. And then after the Iraqi people went to vote, I watched him and I thought, oh, wow, you know, Paul, you helped. You did this. You know, you were a part of this. You're helping free these people. It is a big deal. You know, he'd give you that good advice that later on you realize, yeah, old Smitty was right. She listened to him in the first place. Speaking for those of us who knew Sergeant First Class Paul Ray Smith as a boy and a man, as a husband and father, a brother and friend, how proud we are of his life of duty and dedication, of, of commitment to country, democracy, and freedom, and of his death of valor and distinction. The citation speaks for itself. Uh, 
never leave a fallen soldier on the battlefield. That's exactly what he was doing. To see how, how the nation acknowledged Paul, you know, it, it makes us feel very grateful and, and very glad, you know, and, and I wish every soldier can be recognized like that. If you look at the NCO Creed, that was Smitty. He lived every line of it, word for word. You know, take care of your soldiers, mission first. He just never wanted to be in the limelight. And yet, he threw his whole family in the limelight. And if anything, he's sitting up on that cloud going, ha, 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 you guys have to do it, not me. He was just an ordinary kid that became an extraordinary man.